How much more did you influence do you have than those jackasses had at that time? Just how much? None. Absolutely none. And having seen that had a terrific effect on me. And this I've never told you before, but I think I can say it here that we have not have all members and people who ought to know what the score is. I was awful embarrassed ever after that to have to go to market with my production. I was uneasy. I would feel up here, see if I could feel my ears. <laughs> I felt like a jackass. Because I was there letting that buyer tell me what he was going to pay me for my production. And I never failed to see when I drive by a market, whether it's an auction market, an elevator, or terminal yards, for just a little bit, everybody there seems to have years <laughs> like a jackass. And in my opinion, when there is an available program to change that and to put me and you on the same basis that the people that we envy, the businessmen of, these people, of this nation who set their own price, I get awful ashamed. And I think you should too because you are playing the part of a jackass as long as you will endure it. So when I put my production through the NFO, I felt pretty proud of that because I thought them jackasses out there had to kind of envy me for having a few brains <laughs> trying to solve my own problem. We've got the program and we've got the only program and I'm not, it's not my intention whatsoever to run down any other organization or group that is trying to do the job for us to get a price. We have to evaluate what are the possibilities of making it. In the outset of our organizing, at least in the meetings I held, it always happened. And I'm talking way back, the late, the years in the late 50s and early 60s, no matter where I had an organizational meeting, there were always farmers in there trying to take me apart. And to me, it, was, it looked like the most stupid thing that I had ever seen, that people whom I was trying to help were trying to keep me from doing so. And I made the statement then that never, under any condition, will I ever hinder anybody that is trying to help me. Never be negative about them. There are a lot of methods that are being used in an effort to bring up our prices. But if we'll just stop and think, they are not going to work. I'm talking about those outside of the collective bargaining program. We're interested in legislation, you better believe it. That's why we keep Chuck Fraser, one of the best farm lobbyists in the United States in Washington. I'm lazy. Somebody else is going to give me a price and I'm willing to take it. But I don't believe that I'm stupid enough to wait for it. I told you this is an organized campaign to make darn sure that all the heat is turned on the food prices, that the prices are not brought up. If you doubt such a thing, that such things are done and done through the news media with millions and yes, billions of dollars behind it, I suggest you get a book by the name of an American business. The man that wrote it 
was the public relations director, the head of it for the company, which was at that time United Fruit. He points out that he personally, through the authorization of that company, paid the New York Times three million dollars for advertising. The advertising was to sell United States government bonds, full page ads, and they paid the United or the New York Times three times what a full page ad would normally cost. To get the United the New York Times to write their story, which was subversive in my opinion, on the front page of the New York Times the way they wanted it so that they could get it into the Washington Post picked up by UPI and what's the other one? AP. Now who can tackle a company like that? You certainly can't say that's a bribe when that patriotic group buys uh, advertising to sell government bonds, can you? Nor can you ever establish that tied to it was the agreement that they write the story to get government aid subsidies for a three billion dollar company out of the United States government. The news media did the job for them. It's organized. You're never going to get it out of Congress. And I think we saw a good sign of it this year. In my home state, the state of Iowa, the best, in my opinion, the finest farm senator we had in the United States, Dick Clark, was defeated. And in his place, we got what, in my opinion, is the worst enemy the American farmer can have. Dick Clark was behind every good farm program there was. It was organized. He went, and so did many others. Now we're in a, getting into such a small minority, I believe actually of what, about 1.6 million active producers and 220 million, 2222 million na national population. Do you think if the news media successfully convinces the American consumer that the food price is the entire problem, that any United States congressman or senator is ever going to have the guts to vote for you a fair price? Now I talked to this group too that Oris Kenerva mentioned down here in that exhibition and ask them what their program was and how they were going to get the price. And I'm glad they're doing what they are doing. The point that they made, they are trying to inform the American public what the situation really is. And certainly it needs to be done, and I hope a lot of people do it. But I asked them a few other questions. I had them believe in I somebody didn't even understand NFO. I called it FNO. And such things and had them correct me, see, so I could make the point, make it look neutral. <laughs> but they condemned the program of the NFO. It won't work because you've got to have all the farmers in it to get it. So I said, how many you need in your organization? Oh, whatever we can get, don't make any difference. I said, how many you need to get us a fair price? I didn't really know. Can you do it if you get them all? Well, no hands all about that. But if we get them all, why well, it'll be a lot easier to convince the American consumer that the farmer is in trouble, and then maybe we will get higher prices. Well, let's take the reasoning of that. Let's see how it's going to work. When everybody in the United States understands that the farmer is losing money, losing his farm, 
his ability to educate his children and do with them what he wants to do. Do you think that those women are going to go in the grocery store and demand to pay more? Now you know that the farmers are in trouble, every one of you, and let's ignore the men here for a minute and talk to the women. Every one of you knows that every farmer in the United States, regardless of what the commodity is, is in trouble. Now you people here in Iowa, or Midwest, Missouri, where we are, we don't raise oranges, do we? But we know the orange growers are having trouble too, and we're farmers and we understand it well. How many of you have ever told the grocer you wanted to pay more? That wasn't enough. You're not all livestock producers either. Some of you are grain producers. And you knew that the livestock producers were in plenty of trouble. How many of you gone into the butcher shop and said, now look, I'm not paying you any dollar and 89 cents a bushel for or $8.89 a pound for pork chops. Those far hog producers got problems. Take out two and a half a pound. How many of you ever did that? How many do you think are ever going to do that? You know they're not. So I don't care how much you educate them, they aren't going to pay you. Until you get into the position you say, this is what you're going to pay or you're going to quit eating. <laughs> and when you tell that housewife that, your problem is solved. And she's going to pay it. She's going to bitch. <laughs> I guarantee you she is. But if I may be just a little bit vulgar, after this many years, who gives a damn? <laughs> you think you can't get a price when you decide you've had enough and you're going to get one? When the farmers get together and say, this is the price you're going to pay, just what are they going to do about it? They're going to pay it. And we are the most powerful group on earth. We envy, some of us at least do, organized labor. Others don't understand what they're doing and think they're nothing but evil. Same thing as the housewife, if she ever going to have to pay for it. We envy them that they set the price on their wages. We cuss them for doing it. I don't care if you do. Only thing I want to know, when you going to get smart enough to do the same thing? How about anybody else? The automobile companies in this country. Where do you think they would be if they ask their dealers what they want to pay them for automobiles. You better believe there wouldn't be any General Motors, there wouldn't be any Ford, Chrysler, or American Motors. We think they're powerful. They got us over a barrel. Yet when they decide they're not going to let us have a car unless we pay that increase in price, we think they're extremely powerful. They're making us do it. We can't help ourselves. The heck we couldn't. We don't have to have a new car this week, next week, months after. We can drive that used jalopy another year if we have to. How far do you think they're going to go on used food? And how well do you think they're going to like it? <laughs> and I'm going to quit eating. 
they going to pay it when you get man enough to tell them they have to. And until you do that, you don't deserve a fair price. If you haven't got the backbone to support your organization to get you that price, to put your commodity, your production through it, to help get that price, instead of going around it and actually making the rest of us get it in spite of you, brother, you don't deserve a price. You deserve to be destroyed. And unless you wake up and get with it, you're going to. I hear a lot of people say, and no use of me doing anything in my county, my county dead. Won't anybody do anything? Every time I hear that, I know where the dead one is. <laughs> in fact, a lot of times I think I can smell them. <laughs> and I consider it a special privilege to be on this program with Oris Canerva for one reason, that a guy, he convinced me that if anybody's got anything on the ball, something's going to happen. Something that he doesn't even know that I know. When we had the first bargaining and our meeting for action in Des Moines, Iowa, we had just entered Minnesota from the south, three of us, Lee Elliott, uh, Woodward, I believe, and myself went in to the southern counties in Minnesota. I went in on the, south, on the west side, I think Lee Elliott on the east side or the center, and the other one on the other side. We had just organized a few counties. Now, Minnesota is a big state, a long state. And we had here an organization in this meeting for action out of clear the northeast corner, out of Hibbing, the Iron Range. And as I stood, understood Minnesota, there was a, a, a streak of granite across it, kind of catty corner. And if I'd had to send organizers, I wouldn't even looked at northeast Minnesota, because in my opinion, wouldn't have been nothing up there to organize but tombstones, see, made out of this granite. <laughs> and I wasn't convinced at this point that those people were, 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 were desperate yet. <laughs> but here we had an organization way up there out of an area most of us hadn't even heard of in this meeting for action in Des Moines. The only spot in the United States that I know of where organization came about, you might say, spon uh, spontaneously. And then again, it wasn't spontaneously either. Here was Oris Canerva up there organizing those guys clear up in that corner. And we had an organization there, I'd say, cut off from the rest of it about 500 miles because one man went ahead and did something about it. So don't tell me your county is dead or nobody will do anything in your county. You are the dead one if nothing's happened. You are the guy that won't do anything, and you had better face it squarely. I enjoyed the fish story very much, and that they finally had to quit because it was the end of the season. I think that's where we are, or heading in this organization, to the end of the season. But also, in my opinion, the last season. 
I'd say the good Lord is going to have to be with these United States in a very, very big way if we've got another opportunity a year from now. I personally do not believe it's there. We have to do something. Now we're there. We're there. What was it we were after? Go back years ago. The times have been referred to here by a number of people tonight. Well, we hoped the heck we could get everybody, all the counties in Iowa and Missouri organized. And most of us were in a county all by ourselves with no county organized on any side of us. At least that was my situation. In fact, when they come up there into my county, they told me I was the only one they needed to, to have a one. <laughs> so I joined that to do it. <laughs> so I joined. And I found out the guy stretched the truth a little. <laughs> So I had to get out and organize. Well, we went to organizing and joining counties. Finally, we had the whole state of Iowa organized and nothing else to do. We had to go into Minnesota, South Dakota, and Nebraska, and we kept right on going. And then we thought, well, we'll just get the whole United States organized, all the 48 states. So we went ahead and we did that. And a few belly aching a little. We could just get some publicity, good or bad, just so they don't spell our name wrong. <laughs> Brother, you better believe it. We got the publicity, and they didn't spell our name wrong. <laughs> and at times we were wishing that they had spelled it wrong. We got the publicity. Well, we weren't satisfied yet. But we just sell something. Even if we lose our shirt so we can say Anna Vogt sold something. We don't care whether we get a price or not. Well, we sold something. But oh, the bitching. Because <laughs> they could have got it with a crane. Could have gotten a nickel more. But we put together a program realized, you know, we couldn't do it by just one area. We had to cover the entire area, so that's what we did. The marketing areas were set up, organization put in, and movements started all over the nation. We had it, but we weren't satisfied. Now by this time we had something else develop, and that's a desire by those or many of those who had worked a long period of time to have the other member, let's say, admire them. So now we went through a period where all our members were marked ears. They were going around telling, no, I shouldn't say all of them, a lot of them, going around telling other me members how much they had sacrificed to support the NFO, lies till who laid the chunk. Because now it was the popular thing to have put your production through the organization and taken a good skinny. That made me feel like I was a big shot. That guy had to respect me. Boy, I sacrificed for the benefit of the farmer. We went through that, and the only reason why we couldn't have a fair price, be competitive, we didn't have the professional help. We had to have the know-how. We got the know-how. And we moved from there then. And today, throughout the United States, as far as I can tell, and any area that I know of, our members are getting more for all the commodities that they put through than any other farmers in the United States. A few examples. A 
Monday and Tuesday of this week, our cattle department sold cold cows to the packers up north here for twelve and a half dollars a hundred above market price. I'm picking that particular one out to point out to you how close you are to having this wrapped up. How many cattle did they have? Five percent of the total slaughter. Gave them bargaining power enough to get twelve and a half dollars a hundred more than market. Ask the boys in sunflowers up in our northwest or north country. They've led it for years. You want a real sad story? Talk to some of our cattle ranchers in the northwest. They had it made once before. They got $70, $70, I believe, or 72 was the price for fat cattle. And we had a meeting up there where we were going to put together some more cattle and price them a year ahead to keep that price on those feeder cattle, $70. But we, had, we hit something new. It's really been there all the time, more or less subtly, but I think is our great problem in the end. Greed. Greed. Those fellows didn't want to sell those 3,000 head of cattle on contract because NFO was making a monkey out of them. Cattle were going to go, some said, to $80, but the real smart ones, they said a dollar a pound, hundred dollars a hundred. And they laughed our representative out of that meeting. Come back when you can give us a dollar a hundred. And until then, we don't want to see you. That's the highest price cattle ever hit in that period of time. All of the contracting, working together, collective bargaining, quit. They were all experts. They were all greedy. They could all get more than a fair price. And brother, you better believe $70 at that time was a fair price. They could have tied that cattle market up from then on at that price with those contracts. They could have put a floor on it. Well, the cattle market broke. I'm guessing now at the time, because it's been too long ago and I'm not too sure about how long it was, but it would seem to me that it was less than two months the cattle market was nose diving. And that same group that laughed our representative out of the meeting called the Corning office and said, send your representative back up here. He said, we're ready now to move those cattle. Cattle market at that time, they could have brought 56 cents a pound or $56 a hundred. And this group got pretty darn mad then. We thought you were going to pay us $70. That's what you said the last time you were up here. But now two months later, see, with the market gone, they wanted $70 when the market was 56. They didn't laugh him out that time. They virtually rode him out and back. Cattle went down some more. Another couple months, call from the same group. Well, they changed their mind. They were ready to go. Cattle market was now 40 cents. But they thought he was going to offer them 56 cents as he had a couple months before. To hell with that, boy. We ain't taking that. What do you think we are, damn fools? 
If I'd have had the chance to answer, they'd have had their answer. That's exactly what they were. But they turned it down again. And the cattle program dropped totally and completely. And by the following spring, we had $30 cattle. NFO program took those cattle up there and the failure of our members to use it broke that price to $32. You better believe it. It was our members' fault in that respect that they could have held it if they would have. I saw quite a few jackasses in that group. But we haven't had any problems there since. I think they understand it. That's the same thing all along the way. We did it in everything else. As soon as the price got up there, greedy, wanted more, and where our own bargainers didn't need our neighbor's help or didn't need to help our neighbor anymore. It's exactly what happened. That's what's going to happen again if we don't get with it now on those commodities where we do have reasonable price and take them the rest of the way to a fair price. Same thing happened in hogs. Now I told you that Monday and Tuesday of this week our cattle department sold cull cows for twelve and a half bucks above market price. And that might sound nice to a lot of people and think, well, no use of us cooperating, we're there. Well, two things can happen to you. First place, the same thing that I talked about can happen if we don't do it. But worst of all, twelve and a half bucks more than a lousy price don't mean much, does it? You're getting two dollars for corn, about half enough and you go probe just as fast with $2.05 as you will with two. You've got to go all the way. You have to have it tied down in a contract from now on. The buyers are ready, and the buyers have been ready for some time. Even back in those days that I was talking about, and it seems to me the year was possibly about, what, 73? 72 in there, 74. In those days, I was telling you then that especially the packers and most other processors were ready to go all the way. I told you then the companies were far more ready to take collective bargaining than the farmers, or for that matter, even the bulk of the membership of NFO. The Packers were in a real dither. They saw their independent status disappearing too. Most of them believed, except the extreme big ones and the most wicked, as far as the farmers are concerned, the independence that they wouldn't last long, that they were either going to be swallowed up go out of business totally, or become custom killers for the chain stores. They also told me at that time about a, by, about a threat that I did not see, couldn't see then, but is happening today, that they were afraid of being taken over by the giant grain companies. And once that happened, they pointed out, it's the end of us as packers and you as independent farmers. Today, it is happening. Cargill, one of the big, big five in the world of grain companies, is trying to take over Missouri beef, the second largest killer in the United States. On the West Coast, an attempt is being made to take over Iowa beef, the biggest. And for that particular one, suit me all right, the devil himself took him over. But it's there. 
the industry is ready. And it's pretty ridiculous that it's the farmers they're waiting for. Instead of getting $12 and a half, a hundred more for those cattle, if you give them just twice more than they've got, they can write a contract from now on for it. Now, the reason I'm bringing this out, 5% is what we had. We've been talking about 30%, and a lot of people believing that 30 won't do it. The only reason we've ever accepted that 30% figure, because that's a figure that anybody in business and industry would accept. But the packers are not asking for that much. Neither are the dairies. And we could move milk till who laid the chunk. Calls every day that want to move, want milk. What are you going to do about it? We ain't got it. Why not? Oh, those rugged individuals out there, they ain't going to hurt their co op because it's theirs. Maybe there again, I should tell a story I've told a time or two of the people that say they can't hurt their own co-op. After all, it's theirs. And a story that in this lawsuit, for having told it, the opposition lawyer grilled me about a day and a half about it to see what the hell it really meant. <laughs> but the story I had told was that I owned a dog watchdog cost me $25 my money on them that was just fine but if he ever started biting me or my family he'd go get it that's what they questioned me about see whether that meant destroying the court it means I'm not going to support anything that's hurting me so you can get a price. We're there. I honestly and truly believe that if every member in the NFO put all of his production through, we'd get a price tomorrow. <laughs> but then I'm not the smartest guy in the world by any means. So let's back it up. That's the first thing you have to do. Get your own production in there. And then see to it that your fellow member puts his through. You let him know you don't like it. That's going to change the situation. But as long as he can sound like a big shot and brilliant when he runs the organization down, the programs and so forth, for alibis ex and reasons that don't exist or that he can make you believe that he's a martyr, he's not going to put it through. But he's not smart enough to know that he's destroying himself. And it takes you as an individual to point it out to him. You tell him that you see a bunch of jackasses at the market going around NFO and maybe he's going to want to come back in and not be a jackass. But that's still not enough. You each of you have to get another man to go with you. And don't tell me that they don't listen to you. I've signed up three of them that came to my door insisting on being a member. So I think I haven't done too good by getting out there before they came to me and getting them. What I call you who members. You who want to join. Well, if there's you who members out there, you better believe there's members who will join if you go out and ask him. That's your responsibility. Can you do it? Is it necessary? How did you join? You didn't join of your own accord. 
It took one of your fellow farmers to come out there and tell you about it and then get you to join. Happened even to me. Guy out of Missouri, can hardly speak English, came to me and asked me to join. <laughs> well, he talked Missourian. And that's hard for somebody from northern Iowa to understand. We're there. We've got it. We've got everything we want. The programs are working. We're getting the highest prices. The processors are ready to sign contracts. They want to, but we can't because you're not giving us your production. You can't sign a contract and then hope people will join. That's what we did in 71. And what happened? Oh, no, they were going to get more. And then wait until the price broke, and then we had to pay off for it. So it didn't work. We've got to have the production on paper, and then we can go to the packer, the processor, the dairyman, or the specialty group, I don't care what it is, and tell them, here, this is what we've got, and I'll guarantee you we're there. We've got it made. They want it. They want a contract. It's the farmer himself that's dragging his feet. But I've been talking about your interests as a farmer. I think we have to do it for the benefit of the entire nation, as Mr. Paulson pointed out. He called it monetizing our raw materials term that let's say a guy like me can easier understand we got to put a price on what we got to sell that's what it is right red that's exactly what he said and we can do it so what's the word get with it and see to it that your neighbor gets with it I made the statement a lot of years ago, seeing the economy as I thought it was, and before it was as bad as I think it is now, and maybe it played an influence in the time when I stepped down and resigned because I thought it was getting too damn old. I said I thought that I was very fortunate that I was as old as I was because I wasn't going to be around when it collapsed. Well, I ain't dying fast enough. <laughs> it looks like I'm caught anyway. So join me. Or let me ask the question that I've posed probably thousands of meetings with. I'll do my part. You better believe I'll do my part. How about you? Will you do yours? 